Greetings, everyone, and welcome. Uh, my name is Amina Yakin. I'm the chair for the Center for the Study of Pakistan and uh, the chair of the SOAS Decolonizing Working Group and um, also uh, the director of the SOAS Festival of Ideas. It's my great pleasure to welcome you for this evening's session. Evening if you're in London, um, morning if you're elsewhere. I think uh, Professor Khan's time is also in a different zone. So, um, you know, I also feel that I should welcome all of you in the greetings, uh, given the title of wonderful title of today's session um, and say assalamu alaikum, adab and greetings in, in sort of Urdu as well as um, English. And I my job really here is to introduce you to the person who set this particular seminar up for us. I've been extremely fortunate and um, lucky to have had a um, brilliant and talented group of students working with me this year on the module that I teach, Imagining Pakistan, um, and both postgraduates and undergraduates. And um, it's, it's always uh, very exciting to teach this course because I've met um, a lot of talented students over the years. And this particular group has really um, taken um, things further and, and taken the, the challenge of contributing to the seminar series and putting student voice on the table because that's what we wanted to do. So to not just curate it from the top down, as it were, but to have um, students setting the agenda as well and, and making this about things that they would like to talk about and hear. And um, we had um, the first session um, that was an interview uh, last uh, a few weeks ago now, which was um, wonderful and uh, really set the tone. So today is um, I'm going to introduce Yasser, who will be um, who will then introduce Professor Khan and then Professor Khan will speak for 30 minutes. Um, and he says that's going to be on Pakistani time, whatever that means. And then we'll take Q&A at the end. So um, Yasser Paracha is on the medical anthropology program at SOAS. His main interests lie in the study of health, disability, gender and sexuality in contexts of colonialism and imperialism. And um, he, I will hand over now to him and uh, say welcome Yasser and welcome Professor Khan. And I look forward to, to the seminar, to the webinar. Thank you. So I guess it's my responsibility to introduce uh, our speaker. So um, Fasha Khan is Associate Professor and Chair in Urdu Language and Culture at the Institute of Islamic Studies at McGill University in Montreal. He received his PhD from Columbia University and he teaches Urdu Language and Literature, Tales of Wonder of the Islamic World, as well as the Cultural History of the South Asian Diaspora. He is author of The Broken Spell, Indian Storytelling and the Romance Genre in Persian and Urdu. Um, currently, he's writing an English translation of Agar's Tale, which is, the, of course, the subject of today's talk, as well as a monograph on generosity and Islam in the Kissas of Hatim Thai. And I just want to say, speaking from personal experience, Pasha G is one of the most beloved professors at the Institute at McGill, and I want to thank him on behalf of the SOAS community for joining us today for this talk. Um, welcome, Pasha G. Over to you. Thank you. Thank you so much to the fabulous Yasser Paracha, who's been doing so much work behind the scenes to set up this talk. And I'm very grateful to Dr. Yaqeen for allowing me to share this preliminary work. Um, I've been on sabbatical, so I'm not uh, Zoom experienced, so please excuse any, um, any malfunctions on my part. Uh, oh, I also want to thank Sunil Poon for doing the logistics and uh, advertising. Um, and Ramzan Mubarak, to those of you who are observing. Uh, so again, this is a very preliminary work and I hope that um, if you have any, um, any uh, corrections or uh, anything uh, to uh, help me as I move forward uh, with this project, that you will uh, present them in the Q and A. If I, assuming that I give you enough time, um, I wanted to give you. I wanted to make sure to give you a content warning. 
I will be speaking about rape and sexual harassment during this talk as they are uh, central to uh, Agar's tale. The tellers of tales and sayers of stories recount that in farthest Montrealistan, there once dwelt a lowly cis male wretch named Muhammad Khan Pasha. One summer's day, as he sat ensconced within his chair of Urdu language and culture, he read a tale of wonders written in 19th century North India. Its title, the Qissai Agaro Gur, written by a person known only as Asi and edited by Khalil Rahman Daudi. It was a queer tale indeed. It told of what transpired when the boy loving red demon stole away Prince Ruby of Poppy Seed City so as to gaze uninterrupted upon the prince's charms. And when Prince Ruby disappeared, his father, the King Mansur Shah, made a new prince of his vizier's daughter, Agar. In this way, Agar, acclaimed as a prince, no longer a girl, became Poppy Seed City's de facto ruler. Prince Agar, a trans man, maybe? As he turned the Qissa's leaves, Pasha placed a finger upon his teeth, astonished as he read of Prince Agar's transformations, his wild tamashas, and his adventures with strange beings with strange desires. There were demons, simurgs, impudent buddies, dejected frogs, a cheeky horse, helpful jinns, magical women, and lustful men. In all of his adventures, Agar was guided by the Jogi, a great sorcerer and scholar who became Agar's teacher and his daddy, but sugar-free. Poor witless Professor Pasha chortled with joy at the queerness of Agar's tale. He thought it was such a unique story, celebrating a trans male character, representing a thinly veiled male-male desire between Agar and his lover Gul. Pasha celebrated with many backward somersaults as he kept reading. But then he read the tale's ending. It's a strong force, the desire to find a past that affirms your own presence. It should come as no surprise that those whose existences have been delegitimized should have a desire for a continuous history, for ancestors to celebrate, even if those forebears are not related to us through conventional processes of biological reproduction. Other forms of inheritance are possible through exemplarity. Mannerisms, habits of touch, ways of speaking may be passed down regardless of blood descent or they may be claimed by a new generation without having been passed down by ancestors in the process that Elizabeth Freeman has called temporal drag. There are many ways to make ancestors. Scholarship on past representations of non-heteronormative acts in South and West Asia has evinced this desire for continuity for historical mirrors, and for the valorization of claimed ancestors. Ruth Vanita and Salim Kedwai's pioneering scholarship and translations have certainly seemed driven by such a desire. To some extent, so has Scott Kugel's wonderful study of the Persian and Urdu poet Siraj Aurangabadi. But other studies have taken a less contiguous approach based upon the idea of fractures within history and genres of texts. Here I'm thinking about the work of CM Naim and Karla Petievich on Amrad Parasti and verbal masquerade in Urdu Rehti poetry. And especially in the Ottoman Arab context, Khaled Rawehib's wonderful work on attitudes towards male-male erotic desire. When I read the ending of Agar's story, I felt a profound sense of disappointment and grief that the liberatory potential of the tale had not been fulfilled. The feckless demon king Gul pursues Agar throughout the story. At first, Gul's desire for the male Agar would appear to be a thinly veiled homoerotic longing. 
but Agar's only strong relationship was asexual and aromantic with his teacher, the Jogi. Agar decided reluctantly to marry Gul. He made it a condition of his marriage that Gul must not make him wear women's clothing. But after the marriage was over, Gul's nanny persuaded Agar to wear a feminine outfit. As soon as he saw Agar in these clothes, Gul raped him. As Gul was forcing sex upon him, Agar kept demanding that he stop, to no avail. The tale does not represent the rape of Agar as a tragedy, but simply as a rite of passage for a woman and a wife. Agar's protests are supposedly the inevitable complaints of the ignorant virgin bride. They can be ignored by the groom who knows that she will get used to it in time. She must be inured to penetration by a man for the sake of sexual pleasure and reproductive success. Afsane Najmabadi has argued that when a tale with liberatory potential ends in a heteronormative manner, that ending doesn't have to cancel out the promise of what came before it. She insists that we can read tales in a fragmentary way without letting everything be predetermined by the ending. Yet we cannot simply ignore the rape of Agar or the fact that he was coerced into becoming a woman, especially for a cis male reader like myself to immediately erase the cis normative and patriarchal ending would be unethical. When I returned to Agar's tale years after my first perusal, I had already decided that I had to look at it, first of all, with an affirmation of historical and generic difference. A kind of pessimism must precede the possibility of celebration. Gaji Amin presents an exemplary form of queer pessimism in his study of Jean Genet's pederasty. De-idealization, Amin writes, de-exceptionalizes queerness in order to analyze queer possibility as inextricable from relations of power, queer deviance as intertwined with normativity, and queer alternatives as not necessarily just alternatives. So in this talk, what I'm doing is borrowing a means de-idealizing de de approach in order to examine how patriarchal imperatives get the better of disruptive possibility in the Qissa. So in Qissas, there are plenty of women who become men and men who become women. Changes of gender through both clothing and bodily change are relatively common. Men fall into enchanted wells and emerge as women on the other side. Women dress in masculine clothing and take to the battlefield, like Gurda Farid in the Shah Nama or Niqab Dar Naranji Posh in the tale of Amir Hamza. But with the exception of one other tale that I, that I uh, recently read, the Urdu and Gujarati tale of Muhammad Hanif and Zaytun, Agar's tale is the only kissa of which I'm aware that centers a person who has changed genders. I don't want to take de-idealization too far to make Agar unavailable as an ancestor or to deny the force in the Qissa of Agar's transmasculinity. The tale does not show him simply as a woman pretending to be a man. Agar's past girlhood always haunts him, although he is insistent in affirming his present maleness. Even the one time when Agar refers to himself as a woman in order to convince the buddy Sarvasa to marry him, he simultaneously affirms his masculinity. So in this scene, Agar and uh, Sarvasa are embracing in the marital bed after uh, getting married. And Sarvasa told Agar, there is a pool in my garden. If a man bathes in it, he will become a woman. And if a woman bathes in it, he, she will become a man. Give it a try if you feel like it but Agar passed up the chance. He said, God has gifted me with a masculine power, Himmate Mardanagi. Because of it, so many of my labors have been successful. Agar's transmasculinity is fluid, precarious, 
and as we see from this scene, sometimes strategic. But of course, the same has been true for many trans males in our own context. But I'm going to avoid speaking of Agar as a trans man. Uh, I prefer to describe him as a male because in the Qissa, Agar himself does not always describe himself as a mard, as a man. Um, on two occasions, he says that he was an Amrad. And Amrads were not exactly men. Uh, for those of you who don't know, as my slide uh, will tell you, an Amrad was a younger male who was potentially or really uh, the object of an older male's desire. So for example, when Agar met his teacher, the Jogi, and became his adoptive son, the Jogi immediately misgendered him. He said, for a daughter like you, I would sacrifice a thousand sons. But Prince Agar responded, I am no daughter. You've mistaken me, perhaps because of my sadagi. Now, I'm never sure how to, how to translate these, uh, these terms um, for the time being in my draft of, uh, of the translation, I've, I've translated it as, it as twink, but that doesn't quite, uh, quite capture what's, uh, what's going on. It's not, very, it's not a very historicized term. Uh, the term sada in this context is synonymous with amrad. And I think it refers to the fact that amrads were usually beardless. Their faces, in other words, were sada or unembellished with facial hair. An Amrad might or might not be considered a man, though of course he was usually on his way to becoming a man. Agar's immature Amrad masculinity allowed him to do what men could not do with impunity. So he entered the space of the Zanana or women's quarters. Uh, he went on quests with magical women. Afsane Najmabadi has even suggested the possibility that in late 19th century and early 20th century Iran, it may have been the boundary between Amrad and man that made men into men as much as the boundary between uh, woman and man. If we had the time, it would be useful to consider transformations more broadly in Agar's tale, how they occur, how they relate to desire and to the meaning or lack thereof of gender and transgendering in pre-20th century India. But in order to do so, we would need to think through as many cases of creatural change over time as possible. And we would need to recognize the vast differences between each instance of transformation. So it becomes very difficult to generalize about trans, uh, transformation for these reasons. I've listed in my PowerPoint some of the most explicit terms around transformations. And each of these terms in Urdu has a slightly different implication. Transformation is sometimes about shifting modes of being. It's sometimes about self-making or self-performance. Sometimes it's about appearances and sometimes it's about real states and presence. Similarly, when we look at the various modes of transformation that living beings undergo in the Pisa, we find a wide array, cross-dressing, disguise, and other changes of clothing Transspecies change, growing up and growing down because some characters become younger uh, in Agar's sale. Um, many, many kinship reconfigurations and bodily changes caused by the ingestion of food and drink. To think about each case of transformation is not something that I can do uh, within the confines of this talk. I would have to answer many questions. So for example, what is normal? and what is custom breaking, kharikuladat. Can we distinguish between or deconstruct the binary between bodily change and changes of clothing? This is something that in the present uh, is important, not just for thinking about transgender, but also for um, uh, legislation around the Sikh turban and uh, the Muslim hijab. What transformation is imposed by others and what is self-willed? How is transformation dependent upon self-assertion and how upon the recognition of others? These are all questions that apply to transgendering as much as they do to transformation more broadly. What I can say for now is that the presence of this bewildering range of transformations is a marker of the profound instability of bodies in the tale. 
Prince Agar did not move only between femininity and masculinity. He boasted of being able to take on hundreds of forms using the magic that the Jogi taught him. When his lover, King Gul, witnessed Agar turning into a demon spitting fire, he blurted out in amazement the following shade. Wo fan kaun sa hai jo usme nahi kahin dev hai ye pari hai kahin shola hai barq hai hawa hai ye kuch na sabit hua kya hai ye what art is there that he does not possess sometimes he is a demon sometimes a pari is he a flame or lightning or the air nothing has been fixed or proven what is he so note here that uh, I've indicated that sabit uh, means both fixed and proven. Uh, proven is the, is the meaning that uh, very often Urdu and Hindi speakers know best in the present, but uh, especially in uh, its older senses, it also means fixed. And I would argue that this word with its double meaning, sabit, is key to understanding the instability of Agar's transformations, which benefit Agar while causing distress and bewilderment to others. At the same time, the remark and this term points to the male desire to prove that Agar is a woman and to fix him in this singular gender. Throughout the Qissa, Agar's transmasculinity is haunted by the possibility that some man will prove and fix his womanhood. This danger infects the audience with an anxiety, a fixation that endures across the tale. We keep on wondering and worrying, can Agar avoid being turned into a woman forever? But in the first place, Agar becomes a male in order to fulfill the patriarchal dynastic needs of Poppy Seed City. Inevitably, perhaps, the state exigencies that made him into a man are instrumental in turning him into a woman when his gender instability threatens the kingdom. So like so many Qissas, Agar's tale begins with a crisis of patrilineal kinship. When the original prince, Prince Ruby, is kidnapped by the Amrat Barast red demon, the King Mansur Shah resorts to making the 12 year old Agar into a prince. And the Qissa says, it transpired at last that the King adopted the Vizir's daughter, Agar, as his son. And he placed her on the royal throne as his heir. It was whispered about everywhere amongst all the citizens of the kingdom that the King's son, never beheld even by the eye of the sun, was to, to, was to be exhibited upon the seat of state. When they heard the news, the people of Poppy Seed City took heart and made pilgrimages to peep at the heir to the throne. It was said among the folk that he was a prince with a countenance like Joseph's, justice equal to Noshirwan's, generosity like Hatim's, and courage like that of Rustam. So Agar's ma maleness was established established in the first place by his being displayed as a prince upon the throat of, throne of Poppy Seed City and by the visual and verbal recognition of other subjects. The people of Poppy Seed City masculinize him by attributing to him the virtues of the conventional male exemplars of beauty, justice, generosity, and bravery. So in the first place, his maleness is imposed upon him by the needs of, uh, of the poppy seed city state. Nevertheless, Agar's maleness became something that he cultivated and wished to keep. But he was never quite a conventional male. He became the Jogi's student and adoptive son, in part because being known as the son of the Jogi was his way of trying to escape the patriarchal state in favor of what Indrani Chatterjee calls monastic governmentality. And I don't have time to go into this, uh, this idea, but it's a very powerful one, especially for this, uh, for this Pissa and for um, the study of, um, of um, non-heteronormative acts in 19th century um, India. But more obviously, Agar was attracted to the magical powers that the Jogi could give him. 
This magic enabled him to defeat 40 kings who made war on Poppy Seed City. And magic fueled the success of his quests. The power that Agar yields through magic makes him a more potent male, especially upon the, on the field of war. At the same time, scholars of the Shahnama, like Dick Davis, have argued that many audiences would have doubted that male heroes who used magic and trickery were fully men. Why would that be? Zara Ayubi has recently argued very clearly and convincingly that manuals of ethics or akhlaq represented certain virtues such as justice and bravery as masculine. In Qissas, the association of, with, of bravery with manliness is so strong that women who make war cannot escape masculinization. Their courage cannot be imagined as a womanly trait. But I would argue that there are other character traits, both positive and negative, that are contestable between the genders that can be transgendered or transvalued. So for example, generosity is a supposedly masculine trait following, falling within the uh, compass of Futuvat or Javan Marti. But when women in Qisas are more generous than men, their generosity threatens to disrupt the masculine gendering of this virtue. And this means that men who are generous might find themselves performing a feminine virtue. The Qissa must then contain this threat by reestablishing the superiority of male generosity. Another such contested trait, which is very important to Agar's tale and to transgendering in, in the tale, is makr or guile, which tales of the makre zanan, the wiles of women, and triacharitra, or women's character, regularly attributed to women. I have a lot to say about makr and a lot to write about it, but let me only say here that it points to a power relation. For the powerful, guile is an illegitimate trick, but for the disempowered, guile is a means of, of escape. Qissas attribute wily and tricky behavior, not only to women, but also to feminized or less masculine males. So to look at an instance in which Agar is accused of, uh, of guile, uh, we can go to a passage in Agar's tale in which uh, King Gul is pursuing Agar uh, sexually, uh, sexually harassing Agar. And one evening before dinner, he managed to get his hands around Agar's body. He tried to feel Agar's breasts. But Agar acted swiftly and he sniffed a magic flower at which his breast, his chest became flat. According to the Kissa, Gul found no sign of Agar's breasts anywhere and he became lost and frustrated. Prince Agar said, you and your bad thoughts, get these false ideas out of your head. Gul said, I know your disguises, your behrup, very well. So with this accusation of behrup, or um, the taking on of many appearances, deceit associated with the uh, low status behrupia community, as he gropes for Aga's breasts, this is Gul's most blatant attempt to prove his femaleness and fix his gender. Agar's lack of fixity is represented as an illegitimate makr, a bamboozling ruse, a false exterior to evade male sexual desires for females or a form of cock blocking. Agar transformed in such a way that should have proven his masculinity to Gul, yet, the stubborn logic of Gul's response is that his transformation into a male is itself an act of guile that is quintessentially feminine, proving Agar's femininity instead. So Agar just can't win. But why does he agree at last to marry Gul? What happens is that another suitor appears seeking Agar as his wife. This is Askari Pervan a ferocious man who lived in the wilderness with the beasts and who was like a beast himself. The hegemonic or hypermasculine man controls women through overt violence and military violence is the strategy that Askari Pervan used. He laid siege to Papi Seed City, 
and from beyond its walls, he crassly demanded that Agar become his wife and sing for him. However, Askari Pehlwan was strangely intimidated when he heard about Agar's manly feats of courage. The Qissa says, Askari Pehlwan said to himself, the one who has performed such feats of manhood, how could they accept having anyone govern them? This is a bloody half-baked idea of mine. This thing would turn out very badly. He was abashed that he had been so cheeky. He made the excuse that he had to go pee and he returned to his wasteland. Once Askari had slinked off, Gul persuaded Agar that while his counterfeit maleness allowed him to be seen in public, everyone knew that he was a woman. Agar's beauty and desirability would put the kingdom at risk of further warfare and chaos. And Gul pleads with the prince, it has been proven to everyone that you are a woman. Everybody is distracted and crazy like a bulbul because of your rosy cheek. Every day because of you, thousands will be murdered. So gradually, Agar grew convinced and depressed by the idea that his kingdom, for whose sake he had been made into a male, was in peril because he was now recognized and fixed as a woman. The welfare of the kingdom and the inevitability of male succession to the throne made Agar feel that his choice was between marriage and suicide. In fact, right after the wedding, Agar tries to poison himself, but he's stopped by his new husband, Gul. So Prince Agar succumbed in the end to the same governmental patriarchy that had made him a male and a prince. And he succumbed due to the perception of his maleness as a feminine form of guile that necessitated his being fixed into the one thing that he really was, a woman. From this perspective, it would seem as if Agar were merely the victim of a patriarchal order that needs to prove his femininity and keep it stable. But simultaneously, Agar's masculinity enabled him to participate in patriarchy in a particular way. He participates in patriarchy in a way that prefigures the process by which he would be made into a woman himself at the end of his tale. A lot of the Qissa is taken up with Agar's quests to acquire women for other men to marry. So for example, one evening, Agar discovered that the Vizir Shahriyar was hopefully in love with Queen Pearl. But the facts that, but the feats that Queen Pearl's suitors had to perform were beyond Shahriyar's ability. Prince Agar said to Shahriyar, well, why don't you lend me your big, big sword? And then I'll show you who I am. The selfish man gave him his sword and said, if you can do this deed, I shall be your lifelong slave. So Agar went to Queen Pearl's father, Raja Basik, to fulfill the conditions. He turned into a dragon and he raced with the Raja. He went swimming in a cauldron of boiling oil and he bathed in a boiling hot hammam. When he had won Queen Pearl, he married her to the sword and then he took her away to bestow her upon Shariyar. Note that Queen Pearl has said nothing about wanting to marry Shariyar. In fact, she said nothing at all, as far as the Qissa is concerned. She was a silent gift that passed between the hands of two males. Her position and that of other females whom Agar acquires and gifts to men is described very well by Gail Rubin's idea of traffic in women. So for those of you who aren't familiar with Rubin's foundational 1975 feminist essay, she reads Claude Lévi-Strauss, the anthropologist's work, to argue that patriarchy, or what she called the sex slash gender system, worked partially through the gifting and quasi-commodification of women that Lévi-Strauss had described as a pillar of human culture. Through this form of exchange of women, bodies become gendered the ones who give or receive women are perceived as men and the exchange objects are recognized as women. So the gifts of women that Agar performed enacted patriarchy and produced the genders that it required. But why would Agar go to such trouble to get women and give him to other men? Why this selfless generosity, apparently selfless generosity? 
patriarchy in the Islamic world often depended on a male homosociality that gave individual males power beyond their individual capacities. Agar's gifting of women was calculated to give him a kind of return on his investment in the form of solidarity with the men to whom he gave brides. And sometimes it does. In gifting women, Agar masculinized himself in a way that in theory should grant him access to the power of homosocial patriarchy. His participation in the system in which he even outdid other men like Shariar should also have counteracted suspicions of his femaleness. So the more masculine he seems, the less the suspicion should be that he is a woman. But in the end, Gul's desire and his relentless quest to fix Agar as a woman triumphed over Agar's masculine power. Now we come to my conclusions. This preliminary idealizing reading of Agar's tale has revealed, I hope, some of the ways in which Prince Agar's transmasculinity enables him to have power through patriarchy. It is shown as well how his maleness is put into question, leading to what is from our perspective, a tragic conversion of his transformational multiplicity into a fixed and controlled singularity of gender. These two sides of Agar are related to one another. The traffic in women that he performs is the same traffic to which he falls prey. I think that patriarchy in Islamic societies of the time was quite different from the form within which we live. Laurie Shannon, the scholar of English literature, has argued that competing normativities existed in early modern Europe and that heteronormativity was accompanied by subnormative regimes. Years after first reading Agar's tale, I came to the conclusion that patriarchy in Islamic societies worked through at least two normativities. One, a heteronormative male-female desire that excluded other males and genders like the Muhammads or Hijras. And two, a subnormative male desire that was especially directed towards younger males and perhaps people of other, other genders and which also uh, contributed to the patriarchal system. In either case, people who were not men had to seek power through association with, tutelage under, and sexual and kinship transactions with men. People like Umrads could have the ultimate privilege of becoming men after undergoing this subordination, while others could only build up other sorts of capital derived from men. Despite increasing concern regarding homonormativity and homonationalism, patriarchy in the West today remains largely cis-heteronormative. At the same time, trans manhood has been available as an identity uh, for some time now in the West, and trans men have been navigating a complicated relationship with various kinds of feminisms, including trans exclusionary forms. So on my various feeds on the internet, every few months a video or an article pops up in which trans men talk about the clarity with which they have been able to see male privilege after their transition. And incessantly, they have to defend themselves against JK Rowling-esque accusations that they're dangerous defectors somehow to the patriarchal cause. I want to stress that I'm looking at Agar's trans masculinity within the confines of the tale of the 19th century Indian context and of my de-idealizing approach. Agar's transmasculinity, entwined as it is with patriarchy, is not identical with transmasculinity in the Western present because patriarchy itself is differently configured in the two contexts. On the other hand, there must be continuities as well, especially within a text that is not so much historical as it is imaginative. Agar must be contained at the end of the story via marriage and rape because he shows up normative masculinities through acts of parody, substitution, and heterosociality. If he didn't pose a threat to men in some manner, I don't think that it would be necessary to put an end to his wiles. So I think that Agar is most clearly an ancestor for those who face rape in the present, especially but not exclusively for trans males and masculine women 
who face the, the threat of rape that aims to fix them into a proper femininity. So right now I'm uh, very deep in the work of just translating the tale and I haven't had much time to, to think about it, which is why you know, this is kind of a gotcha uh, talk and I would appreciate your, your feedback. But in the end, I hope that Agar will emerge as an ancestor in other ways. And I think that in order for that to happen, we need to understand how another reading of the tale could revalue or transvalue Agar's instability, his transformations, and especially his makr or guile. Because however much makr, guile is maligned, it is impossible to deny that it is among the akhlaq, the divine traits that Muslims are expected to imitate. Wallahu khairul makirin. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Professor Khan, for such an enriching and fascinating talk. I wish uh, we were live so we could have done a round of applause for you. So please um, hear some virtual applause there. Um, and the, the, your, your talk has really connected with so many um, issues that are contemporary and urgent in relation to um, contexts of um, trans um, exclusiveness and sexuality and manhood and patriarchies and, and um, the position of an Islamic society when it comes to to that very important question of masculinity. We often ask questions about uh, femininity and the position of gender and women, uh, which it, it, you know is is seen as one of the problems that Islam has in the West, um, right? So it's it's something that's um, debated from lots of different angles, and that's not really something that you're talking about here. You're opening up the discussion on masculinity through this. Um, looking back at this particular kissa, and I think if it's it's late eighteen uh, late nineteenth century, I think it's late late nineteenth century, around around the eighteen fifties or sixties, I think. That's right, and it comes out in Urdu, and it has a very. It, it comes out in Urdu. There, there is a uh, Pega Shahbaz who, who might be here has uh, pointed out to me that there's a, a Persian uh, version in the um, in the British Library uh, from the from the 18th century, I believe. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, I, I haven't, I probably will never get my hands on this, but in uh, Hyderabad, I think uh, there was uh, a woman who who wrote a versified version of this uh, mm -hmm. of this story. I think in the 1880s or 18 1890s. Right. That's really interesting to hear because I was thinking also of that historical moment um, when this kissa is written and what's happening with sexualities and with masculinity mm. and, and also thinking about the kissa tradition and Islamic, the broader Islamic tradition and its presence in um, in India and also that the kissas are available in other languages as well and, and we have the Punjabi kissa as well and, and gender is very much central, seems quite central to them, that question of gender and also that that questioning. And I suppose the, the question um, that I was thinking of in relation to, I mean, you had a lot of people in your talk that uh, whose work I admire and respond to from uh, Ruth Venita and Salim Kadvai to Scott Kugel and, and, and many others. Um, and I was just wondering about the persona of Agar because, and I could be completely wrong here and, and have misunderstood this from another kind of biography that I came across of the story. Uh, is he sort of masculine from the start? Is he male from the start of the story or does he change, does the gender, because there's so much fluidity to the story that you're talking in terms of how, the gender is formed and and transformed and and also the presence of of this other um the jinns you know which is also a, a quranic referentiality as well and and so i i was just interested about this fix it this unfixity of gender and of of the central kind of um persona of the prince as it were i mean is that is that sort of something that we try and fix in the in a contemporary reading or is it in that sort of way in the way that it's written is it fixed from the start of the story or did you find that more 
changing more as you kind of read the story? Mm. Well, you know, I had I had a lot of trouble um, uh, deciding on a pronoun to to use for for Agar, uh, mm -hmm. because he is, you know, at the at the beginning of the of the tale, uh, he is born as a as a girl, and it, it describes it describes his uh, his birth. Uh, as a girl, and uh, and you know the the girl child is is described in in very feminine terms, and it isn't until um, until Prince uh, Ruby Prince Lal um, uh, disappears that uh, he is made into uh, into a prince, and you know because Urdu uh, and Hindi uh, and all of these languages uh, don't have gendered pronouns, only gendered uh, adjectives and uh, and uh, verbs, it can sometimes be difficult to to understand, you know, how the how the kissa is uh, is gendering him. But it was really the kind of repeated instances of his insistence that he is a male that uh, that led me to refer to him as a as he almost uh, throughout. But but even after he uh, he becomes uh, a male. Uh, for example, there, there's a quest which requires him to um, to uh, wear women's clothing, so he he puts on women's clothing. Uh, at one point, uh, he again he uh, tells uh, Sarvasa because Sarvasa is um, is reluctant to to marry him, but he says, "Look, I'm I'm a woman. It's okay. We can sleep together, and there won't be a won't be a problem." So you know he says to her that that he is a woman. So it is very fluid. Never mind the the kinds of other transformations that he that he undergoes, turning into a demon, turning into a into a dragon, right? And so what's really happening in the in the tale is that it's the men, it's uh, it's Gul and Askari Pehlwan and other men in the tale who are doing their best to kind of control the threat of his uh his barup uh, his uh, his makr his um uh his uh formal instability uh in order to in order to kind of contain him uh particularly for the for the purposes of the of state stability but also for the you know and relatedly uh for the sake of, of patriarchy mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. That's really interesting, and and I'm like uh, would love to talk more about that. But I can see quite a few questions are popping up on the Q and A function, um, and uh, before I turn to them, Yasser, did you want to um, come in with any comments or a question? Um, well, I have many questions. <laughs> Obviously, it was a it was a wonderful talk. Thank you so much. I think um, going off of the sort of your concluding points about seeing good as a product of his own time in the 19th century. I'm curious, like, I know you, you've talked about this already, but I'm, if, I was wondering if you talk more about the translation process. I know that, um, for example, like Najma Badi warns against um, uh, imposing our own uh, ideas of sex, gender, sexuality systems on different places and times. And you mentioned like right at the beginning, um, I think you said like a trans man, maybe, and the question of like translating Amra, thus twink, and all the discourses associated with that. I was wondering if you could talk about like navigating translation at the level of the sentence, like when you're choosing the words, like, and all the discourses associated with that, like sort of the power dynamics of that. It's it's very difficult. So you know, I'm I'm trying to I'm trying to do um, to translate. Uh, I, I've already done a, a full uh, literal translation of the of the work, and I'm now kind of polishing it and uh, and putting it into into language that captures more of the subtleties of uh, of, of the tale. And you know, by the way, I want to thank um, um, uh, Nusha Bastani, uh, Jessica Stillwell. Um, uh, let's see, B. Khalili and um, Kiran Sunar uh, for looking through these uh, these translations uh, with me as I as I go along, um, and you know for pointing out any infelicities um, as I as I translate. Um, it's really hard because I'm trying to do this uh, translation in such a way that uh, that does seem contemporary in certain ways and that presents uh, Agar and, uh, and other 
you know, forms of queerness that may not even necessarily be connected to a certain character as uh, exemplary or ancestral for people in the in the present. You know, I'm, I'm even doing, you know, kind of millennial things like when I, I mean, actually, Yasser, you know that I do this in my Urdu class when I, there are a lot of weddings in this uh, story. And, and it always says that okay, well, dhum dham se hui. so I'm, I'm saying, you know, it was a lit wedding, the wedding was lit. Um, for example, <laughs> but, uh, but for example, with a with a translation like twink, I'm very nervous about this, uh, about this kind of translation, even though it's very evocative, and you know, it speaks to, to the present uh, in, in a very strong way. Because, you know, at the same time, I'm, I'm doing my best to, to make the translation otherly to make it strange and to uh, and to historicize it. Uh, and one of the, the ways in which I'm, I'm doing that is by breaking English. I haven't done so much of that in, in my uh, in my translations for this uh, for this presentation because I don't want to um, I don't want to to you know do the 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 Desi accent big big sword that this kind of thing. Um, but yeah, it's it's a very it's a very fine balance, and I have to I have to choose very carefully when things when I when I'm um, uh, presenting uh, an unfamiliar English. And when I'm trying to connect it to uh, to the present, then especially to, you know, my my millennial uh, students or or juniors like you. Okay, um, thank you, Yasser and uh, Professor Khan. You mentioned B Khalili. She must have heard you because she put a, she's put a question in the Q and A box for you. I'm interested in the homosocial and potentially homosexual piece here is Agar's masculinity at any point underscored by his own desire for women rather than the act of gifting women to other men. Yeah, this is so this is so hard to it's so hard to, to tell whether this is the case because indeed Agar uh you know the way in which he acquired substitute for them in marriage. So, you know, in one case, he he marries, uh, oops, uh, one second. Am I, am I back? Is my inter internet connection? Yeah, you okay? just went away for a minute, but you're back. Okay, okay, so. Well, less than a minute, a second. <laughs> okay, so, so Agar, you know, in, in one case, he, uh, as I mentioned, he marries uh, Queen Pearl to uh, Shariar's sword. Uh, in one case, he, um, he marries uh, Roshan Rai Pari um, by referring to himself during the nikah as Manu Cheher, and he then gives her to, to Manu Cheher. And, Sar and in the case of, of Sarvasa, uh, he in fact um, you know, marries her and, and sleeps with her. Um, to, um, I don't remember which, uh, which of the, the viziers. Um, so there is indeed a question of to what extent uh, his own desire is uh, is involved in these kinds of transactions, and, and that's something that, you know, after this de-idealizing um, uh, thought process, I really need to think about. So thank you to to be uh, be they've been they've been very instrumental to in fact the way in which uh, the pessimistic way in which uh, I've uh, I've thought about this, and I want to um, point out that that B's own work on on Hijra's, uh, has been very um, uh, important for me. Okay, great. Um, we've got another question, which perhaps connects with the previous one, but in, in a different way, from Sana Beg. Can the term page be substituted for an Amra? Can we view the masculine erotic sensibilities today through the top slash bottom dynamic? So I mean I, I don't know uh, I've I've not uh, heard the term the term page uh, I would love to to know more about uh, about this um, and if uh, if Sana could uh, you know uh, tell me more about it or email me about it I'd I'd love to to know more but definitely uh, the the top bottom bottom dynamic is what really um, 
not only makes the, the, the difference between the Amrad and the, and the Luthi, uh, i.e. The, the older man who is the Amrad's uh, lover, uh, but which, but also uh, dictates the amount of opprobrium that uh, was directed towards either member of uh, of this um, uh, sexual duo, and that's something that uh, Khaled al uh talks about in a very um, in a very uh, detailed and precise way. So certainly, you know, top bottom is uh, is very important. But you know, I want to point out that. Um, you know, I, I, I cut out a part of this talk that uh, that um, discussed uh, the phenomenon of what I call loverly masculinity, which is a kind of masculinity that anyone who has read the Ghazal uh, is familiar with, in which the man, whether he, the older man, whether he is uh, um, in a relationship with, whether he's pursuing an Amrad or a female, um, makes himself out to be the subordinate uh, partner, right? Makes himself out to be, you know, slain by the by the tress of, of his or her lock and and so on. So you know he is the the one underneath. While in fact, in structural terms, he is um, he has the the power. And this, you know, it doesn't matter whether it's a, whether the beloved is a male or a, or a female. This is the case. So so it's this kind of you know topsy turvy. Uh, vertiginous performance of uh, of um, manly submissiveness uh, that happens. So top and bottom, in other words, are kind of you know they're they're involved in this sort of somersault. Okay, great. Um, thank you. There. While while you've been talking, I, I just looked at my name and it's coming up as Amina Khan. I thought obviously all this talk is causing some sort of transformation. Anyway, <laughs> but, but my surname is Yakin. <laughs> So um, there's a question from Christian James. Uh, do you read any significance into the etymologies of the author's lexical style? For example, Behrup derives from Sanskrit and Makar from Arabic, both being terms that apply to Prince Agar's behavior. Do you perceive any differences in the way such terms are applied, which might have implications, for example, regarding perceptions of non-normative gender relations in Sanskritic and Islamic societies? Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure. I mean, you know, there, there are certainly, um, uh, Agar is described in, in many different terms. So, you know, Baran, uh, baran Badalna, which, you know, uh, Sanskritists will, will uh, recognize, for example, is, is a very common uh, term for, for transformation in, uh, in Agar's tale. But I'm not sure that I would, you know, I, I'm not, really very interested in in distinguishing between the sanskritic and the the islamic it, you know I, I i think that i would i would resist kind of uh following these two as as separate uh, strands in the in the story to be to be very honest mm -hmm. but but thank you for the for the question it's just an interesting one hmm that's really an and uh, a good point and i think that's been um, also, something that Shamsa Rahman Farooqi has wrote, written about, isn't it? The kind of in, in with regards to the Indic contexts and how Sanskritic and Islamic had kind of come together in that narrative. Um, okay, um, there's a question from um, anonymous an anonymous attendee. I'm going to skip people who are uh, who asked a question a second time, and I will come back to you at the end if we have time, just so that, that we give everyone an opportunity. Um, so uh, the anonymous attendee question is, as someone who is doing a literary analysis of Amir Khosrow's work in book, uh, Bridge Hindi, should an in uh, should an in depth translation precede a literary analysis? even though the language is easily discernible by the reader sorry i might have misread something i'm not sure i'm not sure what uh, even though the language is easily discernible by which which reader that's the question um i mean um to to answer that in in according to whatever i understand um i think um i mean certainly Translating this piece, I, I, of course, I don't always translate what I what I analyze, uh, uh, but you know, undoubtedly, uh, doing a 
doing an, doing a translation of, of this piece, especially my literal translation, has certainly helped me with uh, my literary analysis. Yeah. Okay, great. Uh, there's a question from Dean Akadi. At the end of your talk, you mentioned that without certain necessities and pressures, Ugger's magical adventures could have continued, but could they have, or is the containing and subduing of Ugger inevitable? The reading public revolting if such a wild card were permitted to carry on in the end. Yeah, no, I, I, I don't, I, I can't remember whether I, whether I said that Agar's um, adventures would have continued, but I, I do think that, you know, in the, well, I mean, of course, it's an imaginative uh, work of, uh, of verbal art, but, uh, but certainly, you know, even, even imaginative texts are, are circumscribed by what is imaginable for, uh, for their, um, uh, for their societies. So I think, Dean, that uh, you're absolutely right, that it is, it is an inevitability that, uh, that he would have his gender fixed as, uh, as feminine because, simply because his, uh, the, the, the danger of uh, his instability is, is, uh, is too great for the state and for, uh, for patriarchy. Okay, great. Um... There is a um, question from Georg. It's a very long question. Um, okay, uh, he's wondering if you could dwell on ancestry and on the question of ancestry and um, quoting Marx here. Men make their own history, but they do not make it as they please. They do not make it under self-selected circumstances, but under circumstances existing already, given and transmitted from the past. The tradition of all dead generations weighs like a nightmare on the brains of the living. And it is a long quotation, so uh, there, there's I will another... ask you to have a look at it on. So sure. So there's a second. Uh, there's a yeah, second let's get question to the question. Uh, it's a dense debate right now in Pakistan after this and last year's audit march. There's a deep desire to prove that queerness is nothing new to the continent, subcontinent in order to... Uh, I, I can read the rest of it out if you like. I'd like to add that there's a very dense debate right now in Pakistan after this and last year's audit march around queer and LGBTQ rights. There is a deep desire to prove that queerness is nothing new to the subcontinent in order to counter the right wings, claim that queerness is not in line with Pakistani culture. And while, of course, there have been sex and gender conflicts since the origin of patriarchal and class society, and thus also queerness, I think it's important to not derive rights from history, ironically saying this as a historian. I think we should accept that society has changed and so have our needs, and thus identities, of course, in mediated and not direct deterministic ways. I'm not sure if this is a question or a No, I, I, I think I, I understand what, uh, what, okay. uh, what's, what's being said. And, and um, you know, absolutely, I, I think that um, while it's, it's, uh, it's so important to, um, to affirm uh, the rights of, uh, of uh, queer and um, trans uh, non-binary people in, in places like, uh, like Pakistan, um, it's important at the same time not to um, idealize uh, the the past in a way that uh, in a way that uh, malforms it, um, and in a way that uh, might in fact cover over uh, other possibilities that the exemplarity of the past uh, provides, whether positive or, or negative. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Yeah, I think that's a question we could definitely talk about for a long time, couldn't we, in terms of the debate and the disagreements um, and, and the importance of, of, you know, having that open conversation and whether it's even possible to do that uh, in within the country. Um, so there's a question from uh, Samia Khatun. Uh, Pasha, in a characteristically insightful piece, Tony Morrison tells us that if we think of a literary production as a dream, um, the subject of the dream is always the dreamer, the author. Can you tell us what this drama might tell us about the architecture of the 19th century Urdu writerly subjecthood? Is the drama about the author's interiority? Or how is this new work that you are authoring about your subjecthood? Yes, thank you, Samia. Uh, so, in fact, I've uh, I've been thinking uh, very recently about uh, about the the kind of um, the 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 aspirational qualities of uh, of Agar's tales, which 
you know, indeed involves thinking of it uh, as, a, as a dream. And I'm, I'm learning about this, especially from Omar Kasmani. Um, in terms of, you know, I, I'm, I'm not going to, I, I can't think beyond that uh, uh, right now because, uh, because I haven't had the, had the time, but certainly this is, you know, I, I don't know about the author's uh, interiority. As a literary scholar, I've been kind of, <laughs> you know, I've had Foucault and, and Bout and so on um, um, knocked into me so much that uh, I think very rarely about the, about the author. Although, you know, if we, if we wanted to, if we wanted to try, I mean, I would think that this is a story written by, by a man. Um, if we were to imagine that he was a man who uh, desired other, other males, then, you know, one could think of it as, as an indirect way of, um, of telling uh, such a, such a tale. Um, but I'm not sure that uh, I would say that as a, as a professor, I would say that as, I don't know, a piece of gossip or something like that. Um, <laughs> in, terms of, uh, in terms of who the dream is for, certainly it's partly for, for myself um, and especially for uh, some of my, my students and, uh, and juniors from whom I've learned so much about, uh, about these, uh, these affairs. So thank you for that, talk, for that uh, question. Okay, so um, we have a question and appreciation from Eduardo Acheron. I uh, hope I've pronounced the name right. Do you, do you believe that we could also see the concept of patriarchal bargain could apply to Agar's participation in trafficking women? How could this relate to the other concepts mentioned here as they apply to the text, such as male homosociality homosocia and commodification of gender so i would i would love to Eduardo, if, if you could email me i would love to to know more about uh, about the specific sense of of the patriarchal bar bargain that you that you're you're talking about thank you okay um there's a question uh, from big new igielski a very interesting lecture do you know about existence of any similar kissas in punjabi no, I wish I, I wish I did. Uh, I wish I knew of any any kisas like like that in, in Punjabi. There's no Punjabi version of uh, of Agar Gurla's as far as I as far as I know. Um, so yeah, I mean you know the the text that uh, that we're we're most aware of Hiranja, Soni Mehival, Sasi Punnu, etc. I I don't recall um, cases of um, of uh, such transformation in, in those uh, in those tales, but then again, you know, I, there there are certain ones like Saiful Maluk or um, you know uh, Yusuf Zulaikha that I haven't read, so it's it's quite possible and likely that they're that they're there. Hmm. Yeah, it's fascinating, and and I suppose the discussion of, of caste is quite in, uh, interesting. I was thinking in in terms of the kind of from the world of princes to the world of, of sort of um, different types of power dynamics and, and the kind of land um, and the landscape that they occupy is, is quite uh, different. So, so the, the politics of, of this, this particular kissa is quite interesting in the time that it is written and, and the kind of public that it's aiming for or the kind of audience it's aiming for in, in that zone. And, um, and certainly it doesn't seem to be because I think one of the things that strikes me about sort of a kissa like he Ranja is that there is a there is a kind of empowerment of uh, women within it as well, whereas this this one seems to have a have quite an ambiguous relationship or ambivalent relationship to how that gets constructed in the first place. There's, there's a lot more fluidity, as you said, but then an emphasis on the masculinity. Um, Georg is thanking you for your uh, response to him. And uh, it's uh, expressing his appreciation. Thank you, Georg, for your question. And for um, uh, there's a question from Claire Pamond. Thank you for a beautiful talk. Curious if you had found similarities to the gendering and sexualizing of Khwaja Sera in 19th century literature. Nicholas Abbott has some recent work on various Latifas. If this was something that you had considered. Yeah, so so of course you know I've I've thought a lot about the about uh, hijras or khaja saras, 
in relation to the category of uh, in, in relation to the to the trans category. Um, and one of the things that I would uh, like to ask uh, uh, Claire at some point is about the about the Berupias because I was I was very interested in this um, characterization of uh, of Agar by Gul as performing Berup, which not only um, you know points to uh, his makar his his guile, but also uh, sort of um, uh, allies him associates him with these members of what is certainly a, a lower um, uh, a lower caste, uh, these people with a with a lower status, who are uh, also thought of as um, as dangerous or threatening or you know um, or unserious in in some ways. Um, I'm very interested in Jessica Hinchy's uh, uh, work, for example, as well as uh, uh, as well as Claire's work uh, on the uh, on the hijras. Um, one of the things that that Hinchy uh, points out. Uh, is that um, uh, certain communities like the the Bhagatiyas who, who were uh, doing uh, cross dressing um, were treated under the same legislation as British colonial legislation as uh, as the uh, as the hijras, um, and I wonder whether the Berupias were also targets of that kind of, of legislation, which would have. Uh, demasculinize them in a in a particular way. So so I'm very curious to to know more about that, and I'd love to be in conversation with uh, with uh, with Claire about that. Great, thank you. Well, it's it's uh, you know lots of wonderful questions, and of course, great to have Claire there as well. And uh, this is the point uh, where you wish you weren't in a webinar format, and you could kind of get people in um, to this to the room, as it were. Um, I was just. Um, we, we've got about 15 minutes left to to converse a little bit more, if, if that's all right with you. And, and I'll continue to take questions as they come up. Um, and one of the things that I wanted to um, go back to was um, the the presence of the what you well, you kept referring to the um, transformations that are present in the text and, and very nicely kind of picked up the translated uh, words in Urdu and in English as you had kind of thought of them. And, and I was quite interested in how in, in that question you raised, what is normal, right? And, and I wanted to kind of ask you a little bit more about that, you know, because normal is there's so many ways around which normality is constructed through through the law through the state, through perhaps even that idea of monastic governmentality that you didn't have time to go into. So I was wondering if I could just ask you to to expand a bit bit more, take us into the demons and the paris and mm. yeah, no, it, it's 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 very interesting to me. I mean, it's it's not only so so when I when I think about normal uh, and um, custom breaking, what I call, I'm, I'm thinking of the distinction between the the harikul adat, the the custom breaking, and what is uh, adat, uh, or or what is valid according to to adat custom or akal, uh, the the intellect. Um, and there are so many forms of of transformation in the tale that are significant, but which that but that are less, um, you know, that they're less. Um, jazzy kind of they, they so for example uh eating right all kinds of transformations occur through eating you know sometimes different form different modes of transformation are aligned so for example um uh one character uh eats a uh, kid that is which is a, a rice and milk pudding uh that is um made by the mother of his enemy and thereby his enemy becomes his brother right so so you know for example through ingestion of of a substance a kinship relation is is formed and that i think of that as a kind of a kind of transformation right in other cases you know what um uh things that we think of as normal are allied with the with the custom breaking. So, for example, in order to at one point, Agar actually turns Gul into a woman, and Gul is very is very perturbed by this because you know being a woman is supposedly such an awful thing, 
Um, and he does this by, uh, by giving Gul a sniff of a magic flower, right? So by taking in this odor, uh, Gul is turned, you know, um, in this very um, strange way, in this custom breaking way into, into a woman. Um, you know, where the border lies between, between the normal and the, and the custom breaking is, is very difficult to, to say, but, you know, anything that we think of as, as magical, anything that is, that doesn't happen regularly, um, seems to be what, uh, what is, uh, what is custom breaking, but, uh, but that's a good question. I, mean, I, I, I haven't, uh, had the time as, as I mentioned to, to really go deeply into the specific instances of transformation beyond the beyond the transgenderings, but that's something that I want to do. Uh, <clears throat> thank you. And and while you were talking, there um, another question, which perhaps is uh, I don't know if it's a fair question to ask because you know you haven't really focused on that on this, but it's it relates to that um, incidence of rape in the yeah. text. Mm -hmm. uh, that you do pick up on and talk about. And, and we've also got the very real conversation about rape, that is take rape culture that is taking place in Pakistan right now, based on some, um, some, some alarming statistics in terms of, um, of gender, viol of sexual violence. Um, and I suppose I was thinking in terms of you know, the power of narrative, what do you think might be the power of narrative in a, in those types of um, uh, situations where we're, we're dealing with a situation in a modern period? And um, I mean, and I know modern is a contentious term to use, but in, in a contemporary um, situation, how how might the Kissa or these types of stories, you know, are there any lessons, any kind of it, it goes back really to that point about akhlaq, right? That that you pick up on in in the in your reading and connect it with how essential it is to the telling of this tale. You know, do, do you think these types of stories can be deployed, or or can can this type narrative help us to to kind of make sense of the present? Well, I, I think that so you know so as I as I mentioned in the tale itself, rape is is normalized and and this is something that um, you know this is one of the terms uh, that I um, that I translate in in many in many ways a, a modern way because the because the kisa does not characterize it as rape or or zina or anything like this right it's you know, marital um, uh, sexual relations with uh, with with your wife are are totally are totally fine. But you know, this is where we need to. This is where it is important to to dehistoricize such a such a tale. I think, and to take its negative uh, exemplarity. There's a great uh, Dastan Gui uh, session by uh, by a woman in 2017 about. Um, about the um, the issue of marital rape, and she she turns it into into a into a tale that's really powerful. It's it's on the the quint. I can I can email it to anyone who who wants to to ask. And it, it refers to a prominent case uh, in uh, in India, um, in which you know at, at the end uh, it it went to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court justice said uh, a feeble no uh, is not uh, is not withholding consent. Uh, in the case of in the case of Agar, you know, he he says no, 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 very very clearly. Um, and one of the things that really struck me uh, during uh, when I read this uh, this final chapter was in fact the the resonance between uh, the act of rape at the end of this uh, of this tale and this particular uh, case uh, in which a friend of mine is a, is a survivor. Um, and the way in which it was handled by the by the Supreme Court, and the way in which you know this kind of rape, as well as marital rape, are normalized in in uh, in South Asia. Mm -hmm. Thank you. That's really interesting. Um, Yasser has come back, and there are also some Q and A, uh, some more questions that have popped up, and uh, time is ticking on. So, uh, Yasser, did you uh, have a question, or did you want to read out the questions? 
I mean, I, I had a brief question, just like um, sort of the opposite, maybe of your question or the inverse. Like, I th yeah, we just talked about what what the story can tell us about the present or like the resonances um, between the story and the pre our present moment. But I'm also wondering about the value or danger of um, the story telling us about something about of the sex gender system of that time. I know in your book, for you talk of in the Broken Spell, you talk about like the tumultuous relationship between history or history or historiography and the kissa genre. And also you mentioned that this is more of an imaginative tale than a historical one, but I'm wondering if you see a danger or a value in reading the story as um, a history of or symbolic of um, pre-colonial or colonial even sex gender systems. Mm, yeah, no, that's a that's a good question. I mean, no, I'm I'm still I'm still not uh, not aware of any historical instance of a figure who a trans trans male figure who would be like uh, like Aga like right like this is not uh, this is not the the story of a of a hijra for example this is this is uh, not the the story of anyone who is like anyone who existed in uh, in history at the time it's a very kind of you know, it's a, it's, it is a, a dream um, in, in a certain way. It is, uh, you know, perhaps uh, aspirational. Um, so, you know, I, I wouldn't, I would agree with, uh, with Siam Naim uh, and, and I wouldn't take, uh, take this kind of story as a mirror of, uh, of history. But I mean, I mean, it, it, it's not a, a mirror, mirror of history um, wholesale. But you know, certainly the way in which patriarchy works and the way in which, for example, the rape and the fixing of, uh, of Agar's gender is normalized in this, uh, in this tale is, I would think, a reflection of, uh, of the, way in which, um, the way in which the society uh, worked. So we need, to, we need to distinguish between what is, uh, what is uh, a dream and, uh, and what, is a, uh, what tells us something about the, the historical period and society. Okay, great. Um, we have um, uh, some more questions. So maybe um, if it's all right with you, if I might read a few of them together, sure. and then we can try and fit them in before we finish. Uh, Sarah Malik says, I lost connection at one point during the tour. Please excuse if this was addressed. I'm curious to know if you have looked at the figure of the trickster in North American indigenous storytelling in relation to the construct of the mucker. Uh, there's another question about from an anonymous attendee about readership and reception of this kissa. Are there any commentaries or glosses? Uh, what do we know about its spread and readership? You mentioned a later translation in Hyderabad. Was it widely read? There's a question from Sonia Wick. Thank you for this wonderful talk. I was wondering what terms were used for rape in the text. Are they allegorical or explicit in conveying the act of sexual violation? And could you talk more about the implication of this act on how we would characterize Gul in terms of an ideal man as understood in the mirror for Prince's genre? For example, his right to conquer the virginity of his bride versus his negligence of justice. Shall I stop there Do you, uh, or? Um, let, let's go. Let's go, we go, go on. Okay. Omar's question, and then. Okay, there's know. a question from Omar Kasmani. Thank you for a wonderful talk. It seems to me that there is a whole array of crossings that come to bear in your material, and I wonder if you're thinking queerness also in relation to the diversity of characters, for instance, more than human forms, beings, objects, and substances. Yeah. Okay, so let's let's uh, do do those uh, those questions first. And um, okay, so the the the, the question of um, uh, indigenous storytelling and uh, and the trickster. No, I haven't. Uh, I haven't looked at um, the possible uh, parallels between between that and uh, and Makar, But it's a very interesting uh, idea. Um, the readership and, and reception of the of the kisas. I don't know of commentaries or, or glosses, and it's it's very difficult with these with these kisas to uh, to understand how they were received, is, except through um, you know 
takrizes uh, at the at the end, or you know, thing, things like that, and later later versions of them. Unfortunately, so far I've only seen this version of uh, of Agar's tale. You know, because of the pandemic, I didn't have the time. I didn't. I wasn't able to come to the to the British Library. I haven't been able to get my hands on the Hyderabadi uh, Masnavi of uh, of Agar Gul. But certainly the fact that it uh, was available as a lithograph, and I know that there are many manuscripts in, in Pakistan as well, um, is an indication that it was, you know, moderately uh, popular. I wouldn't say that it's, you know, a, a very popular uh, tale. Um, in terms of rape, I think this, this question is, I've, I've answered this, uh, this question to, to some extent. Um, rape is not represented as rape. Uh, and this is one of the one of the kind of complicated issues that I'm I'm having to to navigate in my in my translation. I think that it's imperative for me to to translate it as rape, to understand it as as rape, and to think of it as rape. But it's not uh, it's not represented as such in the in the tale. Um, in terms of Gul as an ideal man, I think that actually his I mean you need to to read the whole tale, but he is a kind of he um, participates in what I call loverly masculinity, which involves his being, you know, he's, he's always kind of sick and he's crying that, you know, that Agar isn't paying enough attention to him and this kind of thing. So, you know, in a way he's a sort of pathetic figure who then, you know, in the end asserts his, uh, his uh, masculinity uh, in the end because he's kind of, uh, so because he's supposedly entitled to to do so, right? After all of this suffering, at uh, at the hands of this uh, this beautiful and cruel uh, man, uh, whom he male whom he knows uh, to be a, a woman, whom he understands to be a woman. Um, Omar, thank you for this uh, this question. I mean, I'm I'm very interested in in the uh, in the idea of um, of transhumanness or what uh, the folklorist um, uh, Pauline Greenhill calls trans biology. I think that's a little bit of a back uh, back formation, but it's an interesting uh, question anyways. Um, you know, for example, at one point Agar gets turned into into stone, right? Um, is this kind of, you know, can can we think of this kind of a change as, as queer in, in some way? I'm not sure I need to read the theory uh, more, but uh, but that's certainly something that uh, I want to think about. Okay. Okay, great. Um, we've got a few more questions, which I think um, if you're okay to take them, um, sure. and Sunil doesn't mind um, us going over by a couple of minutes, we'll, we'll try and sort of get everything in. Um, there's a question by Cal Brannan on how do you think the colonial post-colonial context in which the Kissa was written had an effect upon the perceptions and interpretations of readers. I think this has come up before as well. Uh, do you think that even amongst native Urdu speakers, the social political context of the time meant that there were common misconceptions of what the Kissa was aiming to comment on? Also, I find it very interesting and fascinating to have a main trans -mas masculine character in the Kissa. From what I've seen, I'm open to correction from um, most Islamic societies acknowledge um, Mukhanats, hijras, although discriminated, but not trans masculine individuals, as though in patriarchal societies, one can downgrade to a woman, but not upgrade to a man. <clears throat> and uh, that's a really interesting point. There are a couple, uh, a couple of people who have written questions before, uh, but I will pick up the questions about homoerotica because they're coming up. Um, there are a couple. So one from an anonymous attendee. Considering, um, and, and a question on uh, queerness as well by Dean, uh, the anonymous attendees asking, considering how homoerotica in South Asia expresses itself repeatedly through the bearded older lover who penetrates the beloved, would it be wise to cover same sex relationships and erotica under the same canopy as a whole, even though it has been um, masculine. Ma masculine erotica historically? And the other question was from Sana Beg, considering how homoerotica expresses itself. Oh, I think it's the same person. Um, so it was Sana's um, question, so that's fine. And there's a question from Dean. Um, I find it 
Intriguing that despite the queerness of this tale that gender binaries and their accompanying expectations and pressures seem consistent across station and creature types, where the royalty, jogies, furries, etc. in other circumstances, social position often subdivides and dictates the gendering of individuals. For example, it is often said that human beings are all female when faced with divine masculinity, or that even female aesthetics are masculine compared to ordinary lay men. Thoughts? So, big question. Mm. <laughs> Okay, thank you, everyone, for for these uh, these questions. Um, okay, beginning with uh, with Cal Brennan. Um, so I'm I'm not sure about the about the postcolonial reception of this pisa in particular, but uh, you know one of the things that my uh, book, The Broken Spell, is uh, is about is precisely the the mis uh, misconceptions uh, about the the pisa. Uh, that existed, especially after the, the 19th century, and you know, especially especially after um, uh, partition and so on. And, and Shamsureman Faruqi has also written about this in his study of um, of uh, Amir Hamza uh, Shahi Sahi Sahib Karani. Um, I don't. So you know, of course, there's there's an Islamic discourse about uh, uh, the the Muhannas, um, and Muhannas are, are mentioned in the in the Quran. Um, but indeed, I, I'm not sure about uh, about uh, discourse on on transmasculine individuals. So that's something that I, I need to I need to do more research into. Let me um, go down to well, I guess it's Sana Sana Big. Um, yeah, this is a good question. Whether whether it is uh, um, wise to cover same sex relationships and um, and masculine. Uh, erotica uh, under the same canop canopy. I'm not sure. I mean, possibly it's possible to to think of uh, of an act as uh, uh, as uh, perverse or maybe even queer, even if it's between two individuals of um, of different genders. It it may simply be down to to what is normative in a particular uh, context. But you know, that's that's uh, speculative. Uh, finally, Dean. <laughs> Dean, I want to. Can I quote a? Uh, uh, as, uh, can I cite a uh, comment in a Zoom uh, chat? Because this is, you know, the the idea that uh, indeed, no matter whether the 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 figure is uh, is a demon or a buddy or a jogi or, or whatever, it is really uh, social status really uh, makes a big difference uh, when it comes to. Um, to um, how uh, gendering and how um, uh, these acts are are represented. Um, so, so I'm going to I'm going to steal that if you if you don't uh, uh, create some way for me to cite it, Dean. Okay. Well, thank you for uh, such a Herculean response to all the questions which have kept coming, uh, which is testimony to your rich, stimulating and exciting talk. We wish you lots of luck and success with this project. And we hope to welcome you back when you are um, at a later stage to carry on the conversation and the discussion. It's been a real um, privilege and an honor to have you with us. So thank you very much for joining us and thank you to all the participants for their engaged, lively questions. I think this is a, such an important topic. And and I suppose the, the one person I was kind of going to throw in, which I didn't have a chance was, was just Judith Butler's idea of gender performativity. And I've been listening to some of her responses on the kind of trans question and that's been very interesting and, and learn um, kind of informative. So I think that might also be um, very interesting for for your um, work as, as you go forward with, with, well, all the really rich stuff that you have. And I'm very grateful to Yasser for um, bringing you to us. We've been meaning to have you with us for a long time. He's made this a possibility. So thank you, Yasser. And thank you to Sunil Pan for patiently sort of doing all the back work and um, staying with us a bit longer than planned. Uh, so thank you everyone and um, uh, Ramadan Mubarak and Ramadan Kareem and I hope um, that we all have um, very 
uh, we will join you all in, in thanking um, Professor Khan for, for being with us today. And thank goodbye. you so much. Thank you. Bye from me.